Atlantic City. Uh, I am I am not easily in favor of this snow thing. I'm a little confused because um, it's me, but uh, different strokes for different folks. I brought a little friend to go with the yak and the unicorn. This is my little stitch. He travels with me and I take pictures with him because I don't get to bring my kids. And uh, so, so I'm a technical writer and I am a super lazy person and those are really important for you to understand why I'm giving this talk. Because it turns out that I'm really tired of cleaning up messes after people have tried to do documentation, not understood what they were doing, and crashed their entire systems, and then they had to hire me in a hurry to try to fix everything all at once. So I traveled around to development conferences and DevOps days and explained to people how they can do documentation themselves, because how many of you have budget to hire a technical writer? Oh, huh. nobody. That's really surprising to me. Not really surprising. And I know this because it's really hard to justify the time it takes to search for, hire, and support a technical writer. Just not going to happen. So I'm going to have to teach you all how to do it yourselves. This talk is called Fear of the Bus, and here's why. There is a Black humor joke about what happens to your company as a key member of your company gets hit by a bus. The cheerful version of this is wins the lottery. The uh, weird version of this is abducted by aliens. But it comes down to the same thing. Sometimes there are people so essential to the functioning of your company or your organization that the best thing you can do is put a ton of life insurance on them so you can shut the company down gracefully when they die. I am not even kidding. This is a thing that startups do because there are some people who are so key you cannot replace them. But I don't know about you. I think it's a little dangerous to be that irreplaceable, and I also think it means you never get to go on vacation. And so I think we should really be thinking about like who can we take out of the equation and continue to be a functioning organization. The more documentation you do, the easier that is. Because no matter how much someone loves a job or a company, there are things that can happen to make them suddenly unavailable, like a bus, or a medical emergency, or a natural disaster, or even telecom breakdowns. How many of you have had the bad back go day? Yeah, right? Somebody's like putting in a line and they go right through your fiber and it's just like so good. So sometimes you can't get to work, sometimes it's snow. And you need to be able to function even if not everybody is in the office, even if not everybody is available. Most operations and DevOps people are running flat out to keep up with what they are trying to do. And the idea of taking any time out to do documentation or anything that seems less than like immediately on fire, the status board is strobing red, seems difficult to impossible. And I know this. Like I know that I'm going to tell you to do extra work and that sounds terrible. But it means that a lot of mission critical people or mission critical information gets stored in people's memory. Memory is the RAM of the human mind. When we get distracted or are gone, we suddenly lose access to all the pointers, right? We, when we reboot, we don't know where anything is. So even if it's documented, deep down in a wiki page somewhere, it's like the console is page that nobody knows how to get to, but they have a link to it. You lose access to that one person, and you lose access to the data. So even if it's there, you don't have the pointers to it anymore. And that's a real problem. And I tell you what, I have yet to meet a wiki that has a really good search capacity. Just not a thing that's designed in well, we don't index it well, hard to find stuff. The way to insulate ourselves as organizations is to make sure that nobody is irreplaceable. They have to have some way to pick up their tasks, cap capture their understanding, and keep going with our organization. I like to think of this as the wires that hold up the suspension bridge. You should at some point, I didn't put it on this slide because we can get hypnotized. 
there's a cable winding tool that winds the cables for suspension bridges, and it just like it twists and then it twists them some more. And there's there's hundreds of wires in each of these cables. There's dozens of cables holding up the bridge. If you lose one of these cables, it's not good. The bridge is a little less stable, a little less structural, but it's not falling down immediately. And that's what we want for our organization. We want enough redundancy to be able to not fall down immediately. So here are the core principles of DevOps documentation, as far as I'm concerned. Everybody has to be able to touch the docs. Content matters for the presentation, and documents reduce burnout. So everybody has to be able to touch the docs. I'm a technical writer, and in my ideal world, I work with a $2,000 uh, word ID, not word of product, but like. It's an ID that happens to have a CMS backend and some databases, and I can do all sorts of like variables and referrals and, and just a bunch of exciting stuff. It's two thousand dollars a pop for me. It's two hundred dollars a pop for each of the contributor modules. That's a terrible model for DevOps because it makes me uh, a, a choke point. Like you have to be able to get something through me to get it published. And while I love all the potential of that, it's not a great fit for DevOps. What you want is something everybody can touch, everybody can access, everybody feels comfortable with. Uh, this is why uh, lots of people are going to markdowns based solution. I would like to emphasize that it's markdowns. There is no singular markdown. Just people would like there to be. Um, there are several flavors that are difficult to parse together. But something that people can enter data and information in seamlessly. Everybody has to be able to enter data. Content matters for the presentation. I don't care what it looks like. I care that you have the right things in it. Because if you don't have the right things in it, it doesn't matter how good it looks. It's still useless. Like, ornamental documentation is not what we're looking for. And docs reduce burnout. <laughs> Every time you can somebody to a procedure instead of walking them through it again, you win. Every time you can say, hey, that's documented, just go read it, you win because then you can keep doing what you're doing and they can get a better answer and the best part is they don't have that I don't want to ask for help feeling. How many of you have been a new person on the team and you're like, oh, they explained that to me last week and I still don't understand it and I'm going to have to get them to explain it again. How do you look yeah. Do you like that feeling? No, I really hate that feeling. I have to, I have to play dumb a lot because uh, my life is getting people to explain technology I don't even understand to me over and over again until I understand it. But I still wish I had documentation to look at so that I could get that to just give it to me and I could read it as many times as so. so here is, is that Trump? Okay, in the back. I changed the colors for the lighter room. Um, <laughs> wrong data is worse than missing data. Have you ever run the wrong script? No? Yeah. Um, running the wrong script is worse than not knowing which script to write because it breaks things. So, wrong data is worse than no data. If you have no data, at least you can go ask. But, missing data is worse than ugly data. If you have data and it's really hopefully looking, that's okay, it's still there. Better than missing data. Ugly data saves lives. And when I first wrote that, I thought that was exaggeration. But then I thought about how many systems we keep up that are subtly contributing to safety, security, healthcare, traffic control, all sorts of things. Like, it turns out that we contribute a tiny part of saving lives, and we need to be aware of that. Like, when S3 went down, or better example, when we got ransomware, what, last week, all over the world, uh, on hospital computers, and we had to cancel the surgeries because they needed to go figure out how to pay for Bitcoin. Anyone who's running XP does not know how to pay a ransom for Bitcoin. It's really bad for like, analysis. Um, <laughs> So, I think that we need to think about, like, 
sometimes it's easier to think we're doing software, but we're doing people like pieces of software. So sure, ugly data can save lives. Roughly speaking, there are three categories of information we need to capture at DevOps. There's automatable, structural, and secret. Automatable data is anything that you could write a script for, anything that you could make a Docker container for, anything that you could not have to do again. Because the first time you set up a server, if you're reasonably right, that you're doing, you're reasonably sure that you're getting it right, just automate it. Then you don't have to document it. I mean, a few comments in the script might be kind to the next person, but you really don't want to have to do that over and over again. So rather than document it, skip that whole step, automate it, containerize it, distribute it, put a few, a few instructions in, you're good to go. <coughs> Automatable data is a safety net against losing information because having something documented is still a little fragile. We still have to be able to find it. And finding data, I think, is the next big problem and the last big problem. And the problem before that, we have a lot of information so much that we're drowning in. So anytime you're asking your team to do something that could be automated, you're boring. Skip that step. Put it in the container, put it in the script, move on with your lives. I like to think of this as like teaching my kids to do chores. So I have two kids, 12 and 14 years old, and I have managed to teach them to speak and make their beds, uh, but pot scrubbing is evidently a super advanced knowledge skill and nobody in my house has grasped it. So I'm going to keep working on that. But I have these child processes that I invested a lot in upfront. It takes a long time to teach someone to sweep a floor without flinging the dirt all over the place and uh, hitting their sibling with whatever instrument they're holding. And it was really easy. It would have been much faster for me to sweep the floor to teach them. But now I've spawned these child processes, and all I have to do is invoke them. You, go sweep the floor. And that's a great savings of time that keeps paying out. And I want you to think about that the next time you're like, oh, it's going to take me so long to do this. It's going to take me so long to automate it. Why don't I just do it real quick this one time? Real quick this one time is a lie. There's nothing as permanent as a clutch. And so you want to think about doing it better for the future. Create a structure that encourages templates. That means that you have yeah, structural. Okay. The next kind of information is structural. Because what you want to do is say, here is how you, you document a problem. Have you ever read the Microsoft release notes? The security release notes? I have release notes? Yeah, somebody? Nobody? Um, I used to write them. And that was the most boring writing job I've ever had. Because all you did was basically fill in the blanks. There's a vulnerability of type one of six types. It occurs in the insert module here. It was so boring to write, but it was so predictable to read. All you had to do was look in the key spots to know whether or not you needed to patch now or later. Having that kind of template really reduces the uh, mental overload of doing something. And a way to think about that is Jira. Jira is not pretty. And it's not fun to use, but it is saving you from having to type in this problem that occurred in version 6.1, and it applies to these modules, and I think it happened like this, and we're remembering all the things that you need to have in order to replicate it. Instead of having to write paragraphs, all you have to do is check some piggy boxes and write like a couple sentences. That kind of structural automation and templating is really valuable, and I want you to think about how else you could be using that idea in your DevOps organization. Like, don't make anybody guess what they're supposed to write. Give them a fillable form, give them, you can create amazing templates in Confluence, put them in place, and then when people fill them out, the filled out forms just cascade down to the template. It's great. Um, the nicest thing I have to say about templates. <laughs> a little known secret of template use is that you need to store a copy of the template somewhere no one else can get to it. Because no matter how many times you say copy, do not, do not save, and uh, make a you know a 
separate thing, and don't fill this one out, and I am copy protected. Somebody will defeat your copy protection and write it your original template. So I'll uh, keep the spare somewhere in the back of the middle of the up. Sad, sad, YouTube, everybody saying. Structural information is also where we keep information about processes. Processes are super vital to making sure that we get everything done. And you can think about all the processes and habits that you have in your life that ensure you get things done. Like, I have a process for bedtime that involves remembering to brush my teeth and take my medicine. Like, if I do either of those, that's, that's good, but I kind of need to do both of them. So, you can also have corporate processes, like the process for employee termination. If you don't have an employee anymore, you need to turn off their network access, and you need to deprovision their, their system in a different way, and you need to collect their stuff, and you need to make sure they get their last paycheck, and you need to make sure they get their corporate paperwork. And having that kind of process documented somewhere other than I scribbled it on a piece of paper is really valuable. And so you do a lot of processes every day, predictable, routine things that need to be followed in the first order. And the more you document those, the less mental energy they take. Like I said, I'm super lazy. I'm all about conserving energy. The third type of information you need to document is the hardest type, because it's the type we instinctively don't document. It's secret information. We're like, oh, I don't want to do that. That's, that's a trade secret, or that's vulnerable. And if you have a big organization, they're doing threat model. And they say, like, these types of information have to be stored this way. You have some rules to follow. If you're in a smaller organization, you have to do your own threat modeling and decide how that's going to work out for you. <coughs> so ask yourself these questions. What would happen if the data is lost? I worked for Microsoft doing something other than release notes for a while. I worked on the BitLocker project. And the original conception for the BitLocker project was it's really terrible when executives leave their laptops in taxes because then there's all this vulnerable data. And it's not unpossible to hack the login, right? Um, and we decided that the data didn't, or the, the laptop itself didn't matter. That was like a, a disposable item, essentially, compared to the value of the data. What mattered was that nobody else could see the data. So the whole BitLocker TPM chip is set up so that it destroys your data. You can't ever access that partition. It's fully encrypted. We're like, whatever. We lost the laptop, but the data is still secure. So think about what it is that you are worried about losing access to. And there are lots of rules around like HIPAA data and PII and uh, financial data, but I think there's a lot of data that you have that you don't want to lose, and you're still concerned about. Then you have to think about what happens if the data is done by good actors. This is uh, you accidentally leave the salary spreadsheet open and one of your employees sees it. That's embarrassing. You have to do some explaining. They'd better be even for men and women, but it's not that bad, right? What happens if the data is found by a bad actor? What happens if somebody actually gets into your data? How disastrous will that be? Once you run this threat analysis, you're going to be able to decide how it is you need to handle the data and how you need to document it and secure it. Secret information is so dangerous because it's so valuable. So also think about what happens if you have contracted with someone to write your website and uh, you fire them? Do you have the password to your website or do they have the password to your website? Because it costs a lot of money to convince your hosting provider that you are the actual owner of that. Same goes with like your Microsoft login. You're like, yeah, really, no, it's it's the company. I know that guy signed up with it, signed up for it with this private email address and we paid for it with his corporate card, but it's our so think about what it is that you're wanting to uh, continue to have access to and make sure that's documented somewhere redundant. No matter what type of information you're documenting, it has to be findable, 
usable and current. Happily, because we're talking about the DevOps world, we don't have to worry about pretty, or fancy, or even user-friendly. We just need to say, it has to be here. It has to be final. Collecting information doesn't mean telling people that they should write it down. It means making it easy to write things, easier than not writing things. It means the path of least resistance is documentation. I put a B on there, because you can tell. I get half a point. Um, <laughs> collecting data for me frequently involves sitting on people's desks and annoying them until they confess their deepest, darkest server settings. I suggest you start with what's called a documentation audit. What do you already have, and where is it? Get together in a room and say, where is your secret uh, shared drive, and what is it? And how can we share that with the rest of the organization? So you have to figure out what's out there first, because it turns out there's a lot of documentation out there that nobody knows about just nobody's talking about. It. If you can, install some internal analytics. What pages are people accessing most? The rest of the content on those first. And I'm always surprised by what analytics comes up with. Uh, I was doing a redesign for Pluralsight, and the, the Pluralsight authors, and the number one most popular topic by like an order of magnitude was how do I use title case? Because title case is evidently super complicated, which I would believe. I don't like it, I use title case. But that was the most important thing. That was the thing that nobody understood. Uh, so we could either fix the documentation, top level it, make it easy to find, or we could create a tool that automates turning your title into title case which would be better. But in any case, that's the first thing we need to address because that's where people are hurting. Analytics are going to reveal the pain point of where people are looking. And if you are watching searches, you can also see the empty spaces. If people keep searching for something and not getting an answer, you know that's what you need to be writing up. It's super useful. You're like, oh, hey, look, everybody's asking about the Elk stack and we don't have anything on it. Okay. Collecting information doesn't have to be about writing a lot of new information. It means getting people to share those personal folders, those uh, files that they have shared to their desktop, and sometimes the post-it notes that they have scrolled on and stuck under their keyboard. The people who are worst at this scrolling away are support, by the way. They have a ton of information, and if you have gone and asked them about it, you really should. It's kind of revolutionary. So, there are some general kinds of documentation that um, you want to sort what you already have into and see if you don't have any uh, things in there. So a punch list is, what do we do when it hits the fan? Like, how do I do this procedure? It doesn't have much in the way of why, it doesn't have much in the way of anything other than, like, do these things because AWS is down. Like, help, help, here's an emergency. The next thing you need to document is who is responsible for what system. It turns out that this is really vulnerable knowledge, and uh, if you have documented it, you haven't updated it since uh, the last time you hired someone, and sometimes people switch responsibilities. Strength the truth. So look and see if you have directly assigned each area to a person, and how people can look that up. The next thing you want to do is like workflow. It seems like a bunch of this, but it's not really. Workflow is how you uh, get through something and think of it as like onboarding. Like, here's what you need to do, here's the next thing, here's the next thing. It's very good, sure. You want to uh, document support info between both how do people support your product and how do people who are supporting your product talk about it already. I swear to you, they know so much if you just ask them. And dependencies. If you need a thing to run another thing, you need to write that down because sometimes dependencies are really difficult to detect. And sometimes you'll be looking at a logging thing and you're like, why did this fit? Oh, wait. We, we, I didn't know we used that software. But where did that come from? That's different. It doesn't do you any good to collect information if no one can find it. You're going to need to use structure and metadata and internal training 
to make sure that people can actually you know, find the stuff that you've carefully collected. I really encourage organizations to have a docs hack day where everybody gets together and works on it together as a group because then you have a much better shared knowledge base. One of my favorite recommendations for DevOps is to put everything in one big flat file. This works with organizations up to a certain size. You just scroll things off the bottom. Like if you learn a new thing, you put it at the top, stuff scrolls off the bottom because you don't want to keep things forever. Um, and we have search. Like this is the future. You can just search for what it is that you need to know in that one big flat file. Uh, and of course, eventually this is a terrible idea, but at least it's all documented in one place with one reference uh, place. Search is magical and amazing, and I think over a decade of Google search and email has ruined our minds, much like our uh, loss of oral literature once we learned to read. And it's great, except for one thing. What is this called? Until about five years ago, you could not search the Microsoft site for blue screen of death. We all call it that. Microsoft calls it several things, including internal error and uh, kernel tech. Not kernel tech. Serious kernel error. And so if they call it that, and we call it blue screen of death, and we search on blue screen of death, Microsoft will never help us. So you have to find out what terms people are using to refer to your software and make it searchable under those terms. Um, so information has a shelf life, and it goes stale, or worse than stale, it gets rotten. So you need to get rid of it. If I could do it, I'd tag all information with a date, and when it exceeds a certain age, I'd just toss it. Because that is less dangerous than keeping old data around. Who here has run a uh, current build script only to find out that you are actually running new build script for the last two years? Yeah. I've done that, yeah. Current build script is the old one, and everybody knew that but you. Um, all the hardest problems in computers are people. Documentation reduces burnout and daily interruptions. And if we test when people are gone, like the chaos monkey, then we know what it is that we're missing without doing it under pressure. We're still doing it under constraints, like we've given them an actual vacation and taken away their, their paper, but at least it's not catastrophic, at least we're not already down. Because I swear to you, if you call anyone in the hospital, I will come find you. I know people who have gotten DevOps calls in the hospital because they didn't document things well enough for, things, for the world to continue in their absence. So, DevOps docs save time and money, and having to post pictures of the Hindenburg where your uptime stats ought to be. Consider this before you go around thinking that documentation is for other people. And I'd love to talk to you about this at an uh, open space this afternoon. We're basically going to do an Ask Me Anything, and I will answer whatever I can. Thank you for your time. Oh, if this was too long and you read Twitter, Write it down because that's easier and safer than remembering it. So thank you.